Good afternoon, everybody. My name is James Glisson. I am the curator of contemporary art here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And we are waiting for all of our virtual participants to gather. We have over 100 uh, people registered to attend, which is great. And our counter says we're up to 58 or 59 participants. So we're gonna give it a little bit more time before we get started. Um, with me here today is uh, Marshall Brown, Associate Professor with Tenure of Architecture at Princeton University. And I'm gonna say a, lot, a bit more about Marshall in a moment, but we're both on screen. And then invisible off screen is uh, Elena Heincock who set this up for us. So I, the participant numbers aren't clicking up. I'm going to get started. So again, I'm James Glisson. I'm curator of contemporary art here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And it is my incredible pleasure this afternoon to welcome Marshall Brown. I wanna talk a little bit, uh, but before he gets started on his presentation, I wanna just talk a little bit about him and all that he's done. He's had an incredibly varied career. So uh, Marshall Brown today will be speaking on a topic, collages, collaging via Zoom. We have a picture of Marshall right here and one of his collages in the middle of being created. I wanna thank our sponsors who made this event possible. That is the Museum Contemporaries, better known as TMC. Um, it's their support that enabled us to invite Marshall as our virtual guest today. And this event is presented in collaboration with Photo Futures, another collection support group. So Marshall is a practicing architect, writer, visual artist, and teacher. As I mentioned before, he's associate professor with tenure at Princeton University School of Architecture, where he also directs the Center for Architecture, Urbanism, and Infrastructure. He graduated with, uh, he has two graduate degrees from Harvard University, one in architecture and another in urban design. And his artwork um, and uh, his, his sketches and the collages that he's talking about today, various permutations, are in the collections of the Art Institute of Chicago, San Francisco Museum of Art, and Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Architect uh, Bentonville uh, Arkansas recently commissioned an outdoor structure by Marshall. He's written very widely for such publications as The Believer, The Architect's Newspaper, and numerous exhibition anthologies um, and catalogs. And I'm, I'm, I, uh, he's talking about collage. I want to just give a brief nod to his uh, many projects. He was uh, invited to participate into the 2016 Venice Architecture, Architecture Biennial with this project, uh, Civic, uh, a Civic Academy in Detroit, Michigan. And the theme of this project was uh, the architectural imagination. So this is an unbuilt project, uh, but but in it, he was thinking about how to synthesize all the things that happen in a city, um, all the different kinds of needs someone might have within a city environment from a community college to a workshop, to a worship center or church, to an observatory, to clinics, to libraries, all of these kind of, all these functions coalesce in this single, uh, single structure. So he's thinking about in a way how to condense some of the, the, the the, the activities and functionality of a city in a single structure. And he is a gorgeous craftsman. So I have to show this kind of close up of a model itself with this uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful surfaces and details. And then also of the same Detroit plan, this uh, collage of pieces of famous, moder somewhat, somewhat well-known and not so well-known uh, modernist buildings put together. Um, and it seems to me, and he'll say more about this, a kind of nod to Mies van der Rohe and his, uh, his collage practice in the 20s and 30s that was so important for uh, his presentation of early uh, buildings and structures. 
Now, another project Marshall was involved in, again, unbuilt, but that's, that's the interesting part. He's trying to imagine what the, how the city might be otherwise from what it is. Those of you who are Brooklynites or know Brooklyn, you can see the Williamsburg Bank building in the back peeking up, popping up above. These are the, um, uh, what are called the Atlantic Yards or the Vanderbilt Rail Yards by the um, Atlantic Avenue subway stop in Brooklyn uh, that have since been uh, developed. But um, early in his career, Marshall uh, was approached by Letitia James, whose name is probably very familiar to people because she's currently the Attorney General of the state of New York, but at that time she was a city council member. And she approached Marshall and a team of architects and asked them to kind of rethink many of the many very, we'll say corporate and not very thoughtful projects that had been presented for this very valuable and very important site. And this is a little bit of what, small part of this, Again, um, this strip would be above the rail yards. And again, he's thinking and the team is thinking about um, all the various functions of a city uh, as a kind of organic whole with schooling, senior citizen centers, cinema, hotel, recreation, and how, how all these parts of urban life can be brought together. And then one last, um, um, one last project I wanna talk about, again, very briefly to focus on this idea of the imaginary is something he, uh, with a team commissioned for the Hum Chicago Humanities Festival in 2011. What you're looking at is a map of the United States and very, the names of various architects and architectural theorists and, and artists and curators and roughly coordinated to where they work. So Matthew Nicoletta and Alan Shearer are based in Austin, Texas. So you see them kind of down at the bottom around where Texas should be. But what Marshall and the team asked of these people is to imagine a future city, imagine a city many decades from now that isn't focused on economic collapse or the collapse we're all worried about because of climate change. Let's imagine a world that, a future world that is not dreary and, um, full of fear and anxiety, but something that's, that is up, maybe not uplifting, but, it, but at least not based on the premonition of catastrophe. And I like that very much as an idea. I think um, in 20, it seems even more relevant today in 2020, given all that we're facing with the virus and a fractious political situation and a fractured economy that, using architecture, using art to envision a better, a kind of better, more happy, more, uh, uh, you know, happy to charge world, but a world that, it, uh, a future that is envisioned not along the lines of destruction and doom, but of something more positive. Now, and I want all of you when this presentation is over to go to Marshall's website, uh, marshallbrownprojects.com, all one lower, all lowercase, all one word, um, and take a look at He's incredibly varied Oeuvre and uh, his um, TV appearances and various kinds of films. And with that, I am gonna turn it over to Marshall. Thank you, James. Um, good afternoon, Santa Barbara. Everywhere else that everyone is, there's really, really no telling. Um, I'm gonna assume that you guys can hear me all right and see me okay because um, James is not yelling at me or anything. So um, it's great to have this opportunity to speak with this audience today. Um, I'm gonna focus on, um, despite the, the kind of breadth of my practices and the different kinds of projects I take on, I'm gonna talk today primarily about one thing, which is about uh, uh, collage. So I'm not gonna really try to justify um, why an architect, someone who's trained as an architect might be um, talking to a visual arts audience today. Um, there's for a very long time, perhaps since the beginning of each, been a strong intersection between art um, and architecture. In some very simple way, uh, this may be because we share a lot of the same tools and techniques, right? Drawing, 
modeling and or sculpture, et cetera. Um, and even if we don't always share the same concerns, we share a lot of the same tools, techniques and media. So for example, famous examples would be on the left, um, uh, Piranesi and his, uh, his drawings and etchings of his imaginary prisons, which of course have been influential in both the world of the visual arts and in the architecture world. Coming closer to today and something that's very relevant to my practice, um, this uh, famous photo montage collage by Paul Citroen, uh, Metropolis, right? Which was often looked to and referred to as, let's say a kind of er moment in uh, modern art and architecture when collage was somehow able to um, depict the complexity of the modern metropolis and kind of violence of that of that moment. So this is um, an image from some years ago of my of the floor of my former studio in Chicago. Today I want to talk about the medium specificity of collage and what is in my practice its significance as a critically productive medium. Collage is a way of thinking, collage is a way of creating, collage is a way of building, but also collage is a way of understanding the world. And so I'm gonna go through three topics and talk about some work in relationship to those three topics. Um, the first topic is really about influence. The second, I'm gonna get into the idea of multiplicities. And then the third, I'm gonna talk a bit about the art of joining. So first is influence. These are some of my influences. Right. Jonathan Lethem, the novelist in his essay, The Ecstasy of Influence, a plagiarism, wrote that collage might be called the art form of the 20th century, never mind the 21st. So for someone like me, um, I can say that I'm influenced as much by Marcel Duchamp as I am Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. So from Dada to hip hop, you know, art, um, many creative practices have really become about the appropriation and transformation of the everyday through strategic inversions, repositionings, recombinations, defam defamiliarizations. One of my um, favorite examples of this was what happened in 2004. Um, many of you, although maybe not all of you, are probably familiar with uh, DJ Danger Mouse's Grey album. Basically what happened was around 2004, he took the Beatles' White album, which is of course very well known, Jay-Z's Black album, and created a mashup. A kind of classic collision of seemingly sacred whiteness with seemingly profane blackness. In many ways, it was an experiment like Robert Smithson's uh, experiment in entropy. The idea of a sandbox filled with filled halfway with white sand, halfway with black sand. A child is walking around clockwise in a circle and then reverses motion. But even though the child is reverse motion, the entropic process continues and it blends into gray. And there were a few very interesting things about this. Um, well, there were many very interesting things. First of all, if you listen to, and I highly recommend it if you haven't, if you listen to Danger Mouse's gray album, What's very interesting is that you can certainly detect traces of the other two albums, but in the end, it's a new work of art, right? It's something which is uh, not entirely beholden to its, its sources. It's something other. It exists in conversation with the two sources. Um, some other anecdotal notes of importance was that he did it without permission um, and posted on his website for free. You can't currently find it there for free, but you can find it all over the internet. I think you can even find uh, albums of it printed on eBay. So for me, in many ways, collage is, uh, is just that kind of transgressive practice. It juxtaposes elements from different sources. It disturbs our sense of everyday reality. So a famous example and one that's influenced me very much is of course Friedrichstrasse, the Friedrichstrasse skyscraper uh, photo montage by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, which goes back to 1921. And this is one of the influences in my, in my collage practice, which 
James mentioned. For me, it's very important that collage breaks rigid conceptual boundaries. It exposes false dichotomies. It challenges intellectual bigotries. And so this collage is actually from the New York project that James mentioned in his introduction, a project for the Atlantic Yards. It's the tallest building that I proposed on the site. It's called the Vanderbilt Tower. And I was intentionally trying to make a collage which was um, a more or less direct reference to Mises Friedrichstrasse skyscraper, again, without being beheld, in, beheld to that source. So what you're seeing here is a large collage of a similar scale to Mises collage, um, where I've combined elements from Mises, the architecture of Mises van der Rohe and Le Corbusier. Um, it happens to be elements from uh, Mises van der Rohe's Seagram's Tower in New York and Le Corbusier's Ronchamp Chapel. And you can probably see just off to my left side, there's the actual uh, piece. Again, lightness and darkness, right? Um, so what I was also interested in he doing here was bringing together these two, what I like to call estranged fathers of modern architecture. These two legacies, which are often held very far apart, right? The modernism of Mies, the modernism, the modernism of Le Corbusier and bringing them together in this single in a single work. Another well-known collage by Mies van der Rohe, his Museum for a Small City project. What's interesting is that collage is actually present in the work of many modern and contemporary architects who've been very influential, not just Mies van der Rohe, but many, many others. And when I ask myself why that is, I think it's, um, well, it's probably for many reasons, but one of the affordances that collage brings to the table is that it creates images which are at one moment very, uh, can make space, can make form, um, create very uh, tangible realities, visible, while still remaining open. Nothing is fixed. Nothing is entirely determined. There's a high degree of abstraction. Collage for me embraces uncertainty. So this is one of my own works from that the Quinder Civic Academy project from the 2016 Biennale. Collage embraces, embraces uncertainty. It's effective in moments where ideas are still taking shape. So in my work, I'm often sampling from the inherited material of architectural history, committing what I like to call acts of honorific thievery. It's important to note I think that collage is what's called an allographic medium. For those of you who aren't familiar with the term, uh, that an allographic medium is opposed to what we might call an autographic medium. So if painting and drawing are autographic media, right, that they register the hand of a unique creator, an allograph media, allographic medium is one that does not. So photography would be considered an allographic medium. Uh, typing would be considered an allographic medium as opposed to handwriting, for example. And collage is an allographic medium. It's, of course, a spectrum, but we don't have to get too into the weeds on that. But what it does, I think, is that collage, because it's about kind of, again, this idea of honorific thievery, it expands and sometimes even explodes uh, definitions of authorship and originality. Again, going all the way back to people like Duchamp and before. So again, quoting uh, the novelist, Jonathan Lethem, it's about inspiration, about how inspiration could be called inhaling the memory of an act never experienced. This I think is a really beautiful uh, phrase, turn of phrase on the part of Lethem. He talks about inspiration as inhaling the act of a memory, never, inhaling the memory of an act never experienced. So another, uh, not a collage, but a drawing, which had been kind of rumbling around in my head uh, for years, Ivan Leonidov's Commissariat of Heavy Industry, a famous kind of unbuilt constructivist project, became an influence for this collage, which James mentioned in the introduction from the 2016 Biennale. 
Um, it's called Towards a Coordinate Unit. And so I'm really interested in how I can conduct a transhistorical, a transdisciplinary discourse with these artists, architects, others who I never met, right? Um, how I can work with a myriad of sources without becoming a prisoner to any one of them. So the next topic is about multiplicities. So most of the work I just showed you, um, most of the collage work I just showed you, my own collage work is embedded within some larger project, a proposal for a site. Um, they, I use it as a medium to kind of generate ideas within my architecture and urbanism practice. But of course, I have another practice now as an artist where I just make collages, which um, in many cases stand uh, on their own, uh, independently from any site, uh, any narrative, any program. Um, I rarely have clients, but let's say any other uh, uh, collaborators that might look like clients or, or, or the like. So this is my presentation from the 27, uh, 2017 Chicago Architecture Biennial, which was titled The Architecture of Creative Miscegenation. And I guess um, before I go too much farther, I should say something about my use of this term, miscegenation. Miscegenation is, of course, a very archaic uh, term that's associated with racist laws, um, some of which are still in the books, on the books here in, in certain places in the United States that um, prohibited um, let's say marriage or intercourse between people of different so-called races. I'm of course not reclaiming, but reanimating that term in a way to talk about some of the things that go on in my work. And so I'll, I'll kind of demonstrate uh, what that's all about. So here's a closer view of the work that I'm gonna talk about now, this, uh, these nine collages here in the, in the middle which are actually part of a much larger series of 100 that I worked on for about a year. So um, many of you have probably seen uh, at least one of the Alien series of films, or one of the at least one of the films uh, from the Alien quadrilogy, quadrilogy which um, Ridley Scott famously directed the first one, in 1979. Um, if you've never seen all four sequentially, I highly recommend it. It'll take you about a weekend, although in the days of uh, COVID and binge watching, maybe you could do them all <laughs> in a long night. So in the first, it, to summarize, in the first three alien films, Sigourney Weaver, also known as Ripley, that's her character's name, is lost in space, right? She's running from aliens, then she's killing aliens. And then in the third film, right? Uh, she finds out that the very last alien is actually nesting in her chest. So she takes a dive into a nuclear reactor, which you see on the upper right. And that's the end of the story, we think, until a fourth film appears, interestingly titled Alien Resurrection, which actually centers around Ripley's return from the dead as a genetically reconstructed hybrid, part human, uh, part alien. Her DNA, as it turns out, has been crossed with the aliens in the military's attempt to capture the monster. So thus, the wondrous and horrific truth is finally exposed, right? After, after three and a half films, we finally get it, right? We finally get the answer to the whole, the whole kind of intergalactic chase, which is that Ripley and the alien were always linked. They were always already defined by and embedded within one another. Now, even more interestingly, about halfway through the last film, we find out that this hybrid woman alien is not Ellen Ripley. Her name is actually number eight. She doesn't have a name. She just has a number, number eight. And at that moment in the film, she and we find out what this means. She learns that she's not a unique original, but in fact, just a variation amongst a field of many possible recombinant beings, many test cases. So the paradigm of form and identity I'm setting forth this afternoon is like this one. It's about the proliferation of possibilities, versions, 
and multiplicities. So the series of collages that I just showed you, and I'm gonna go through some of them in more detail now, are titled Chimera. Chimera, of course, being the, the mythical lion, goat, dragon um, from, that exists actually in many, uh, in several cultures, but we know it from ancient mythology. These collages were actually created with architectural photography cut directly from journals and assembled by hand uh, with glue. So this prolonged exercise actually focused on technique without the constraints of any site or program. In each collage, uh, I incorporate a minimum of three image fragments uh, cut from three different images. And I actually, um, as a rule, don't overlap pieces. And this is a necessary prohibition because it encourages the discipline search for alignments, the obsessive construction of seams, So the edges of every fragment are carefully designed and cut to fit with its counterparts. So imagine them like pieces of a puzzle which is created in reverse. And in many ways, the identity of the individual architectural fragments matters much less than the potential for their productive unions. And what I've found and have continued to explore is how collages made in this particular way actually produce um, what I would call a double reading. Because of variations in coloration, scale, or viewpoint, the heterogeneous effect of collage is still strongly present. However, the alignments and seams actually conspire to create a dis disorienting visual tension between fragmentation and synthesis, between the image appearing as one or appearing as many. And seams, we must remind ourselves, and I'll remind us several times today, are not lines. Seams are actually gaps, they're spaces. So like the mythical lion goat dragon for which they're named, these chimera are both one and many. So I'm gonna talk about one of them, which actually became the source for a built project. This project is called the Ziggurat. And um, I need to make a slight correction from the introduction. This project was actually first commissioned by the Arts Club of Chicago as a temporary installation, um, and then was later acquired by Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, um, and is now installed in their sculpture forest in Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, as you just saw, it's based on a, this single collage from the series I just talked about. And so, Let's talk about how to build a collage. Well, first of all, there are real problems of translation. It happens to be that I also have the original model right here. I mean, this is an interesting thing about Zoom, right? You're kind of in my, in my workspace while, while I'm giving a lecture, which is a strange turn of events. Um, first of all, there are real problems of translation from two dimensions to three dimensions. So in this case, you know, everything that's behind the original image, right, um, has to be inferred or extrapolated. So let's say if we call this the front, what I'm holding up here in front of my camera, uh, everything else as we turn it around had to be inferred or extrapolated. And so I use the model as a, as a way of making that, that leap. And then there's of course, scalar translation. Um, I was interested in making a project which, of course, had to have limited scale because of the constraints of the site and other circumstances, um, but needed to be large enough to still cut a monumental figure. 
And then, of course, there's the translation to a material assembly. The ziggurat is actually clad in this um, fairly new uh, material called foamed aluminum. It um, was chosen primarily uh, because of its hybrid status. It's both uh, highly artificial because of the way it's manufactured. So it's molten aluminum that's had bubbles pumped into it and is hardened. Um, but of course, it's elemental. It's just one thing, just aluminum. And as I talk more about this project, I'm gonna to transition to the last topic, this uh, question of seams. So seams are important because architecture is an art of joining. Um, architectonics, what we call architectonics is an art of joining. Uh, as is, I think, collage. In the ziggurat, what happens is that the seams, these joints uh, between the foamed aluminum panels, which are about half an inch uh, thick, the seams, even though they are gaps, right, even though they are actually just space, paradoxically unify the surfaces of the panels, these thin panels, by running around the corners of the ziggurat. So it creates, they create an illusion of stacked volumes, like massive cut stone blocks. So then the construction of collages becomes analogous to the assemblage of architecture itself. Seams are what in architecture allow us to synthesize bricks, wood, concrete, glass, steel, other materials into something more than the sum of the collected parts. So collage, though a two-dimensional medium, works very similarly. So architectonics is an art of joining as is collage. So, this is a more recent series, and um, this is the last series of collages I'm going to show, which I presented uh, last summer uh, at Western Exhibitions Gallery in Chicago, the gallery I work with in Chicago. As I was working on this series, I began to think about and conceive of my collage work as what I would like to call a fourth life of architecture. In some places, it's been written that in the modern era, architecture has three lives. There's of course the first life of architecture when it's being designed. There's the second life of architecture when it's being built. And then with the advent of photography, you have a third life of architecture, which results in its dissemination in the form of photographs. These collages I make, I would call them a fourth life of architecture because then they take that the material from that third life, the photographs, and reanimate it, you know, dissemble it, right, recombine it and reanimate it to create the possibility of new spaces, new forms, new worlds. So in this series, I was working primarily um, with photographs from what I would call the golden age of architectural photography. Um, the period certainly uh, before the advent of digital photography, uh, primarily most of the images I'm using are also before the advent of even uh, color photography, but you see a little bit of it here, where most architectural photographers were using long, large format cameras with long exposures. So we're talking about a period really let's say from just before World War II up until, you know, probably until the, the 1980s or even 90s. And I was working primarily with three, uh, the work of three photographers, Ezra Stoller, uh, Lucien Hervé, and Julius Schulman. So in each one of these collages, you're seeing images from each of those, those three photographers. So at a certain point, my collage work has become more about architectural photography um, and um, 
the world of architectural images than it is about architecture itself or even making architecture itself. And so these collages, in these collages, I'm really trying to understand something about my own preoccupations as an image maker, as well as as a builder. And as I get to the end of this talk, I want to go back to the beginning of what a collage actually is. Uh, the word collage comes from a couple of different sources, right? When we look for the root in the French, coller means to glue. And if we even want to talk about montage, which is a term I haven't used very much, and it's often used interchangeably with the kinds of works that I'm talking about, montage also means to mount. So between those two terms, coller and monte, we have to glue and to mount. So there we understand both the material and the method of these works. What we have in front of us is assemblage of heterogeneous materials that are being used to create new works. And again, collage disturbs reality through these defamiliarizations, these juxtapositions. And they are the consequences of physical actions, cutting, tearing, recomposition, taping, gluing. Um, I make all of my collages by hand, and I actually don't believe there's any such thing as so-called digital uh, collage, but I won't get down into the weeds on that right now. But there's movements. The movements of my hands become legible in the edges and the seams. It's important, I think, that collage is a medium of risk, right? It's a medium of risk, which means that you cannot uncut a piece of paper. You cannot actually unglue something. So that means that it requires a careful attention to every choice. And collage is also an art of choosing. Errors and unintended consequences. These are also a source of collage's creative power. And finally, again, I want to state, for me, the seams, right? The seams. Seams are not lines. Seams are gaps. And if one magnifies the collage, these gaps actually grow into fissures. So one of the wondrous things about collage as a medium for me is that it paradoxically creates conceptual connections by holding previously unrelated things ever so slightly apart. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you. So um, that was that was really great, uh, Marshall. Thank you so much. And um, I, uh, you know, I I first learned about your work because I saw it in the midst of a very busy art fair. It kind of shone a little bit beacon like with all sorts of stuff. Uh, all sorts of stuff happening. Um, and the, the kind of, I don't quite get how you pull it off, but those, the collages manage to be both have uh, an element on one hand of apparent chaos, but feel really harmonious and beautiful. So I don't know how you get to have it both ways, but uh, you know, you, you do. Um, so I had a couple of questions for you um, and, they weren't what I thought I would be asking. So this kind of, but but this rich discussion kind of put me in a different mindset. And what what occurs to me is, um, in our previous discussions and in your presentation today, you really you frame these as a way to think about architectural space and this abstract space in a way that seems to me not bound by the, uh, the, the, the I'm gonna call it the realities of the three-dimensional three space we all, in re we all actually occupy. You can do things 
um, with collage uh, in the same way that you can with pencil and paper. You can create shapes that could not exist in the world. You can have interweaving and juxtapositions that couldn't exist. And, and that's really rich and we'll say more, but I, it, it dawned on me that uh, a lot of your work and certainly in looking at your website and thinking about your other projects, a lot of your work is about communication and about communication to a broad, broad public. Um, and I was just kind of, I wanted to see if we could just as a thought experiment, think about these through that. I mean, you do, presentate these gorgeous presentation drawings, uh, you're on camera, you do lots of things to convey and talk about these projects. And a lot of the work of an architect uh, like yourself is, is uh, you know, communicating a, uh, communicating a project. And you know, the, th that all makes sense in the context of uh, particular prompts and particular projects and all of that. And with the collage, with, with the Practice, you don't have that same concrete goal of, a, of an exhibition or a building or a commission or whatever in mind. So I don't know if that actually works as a question or not, but I was just, it, it just dawned on me. Like it, it, um, it seemed like a, it seems like another frame we, we, one might be able to think about this through. So I'm gonna, Thoughts? Does that make sense? I mean, certain certainly communication is uh, um, communication is a uh, it's certainly an imperative in the work that I do. Um, I don't make work for myself, right? So there um, and. So communication, the ability to um, make work that engages um, as broad an audience as possible is certainly something I like to do. At the same time, I don't necessarily make work to please others, <laughs> right? So. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, when I'm trying to, you know, the thing, the thing I, 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 at this stage of my career, the thing I focus on in the dissemination of the work or in, or in engaging people with the work, I wouldn't even say dissemination, but engaging people with the work is how can I communicate it without being overly didactic, for example, which is something that, um, you know, um, practitioners of architecture are prone to. And um, I spend most of my time with people from the visual arts world. And the best advice I've gotten is to try not to explain too much, right? So I'm, I'm interested in forms of communication that can um, illuminate without explaining um, too much. So I've got another question. Uh, you, you, do, you have a lot of, lot of forms of practice. One thing you and I haven't talked about is your teaching practice um, and mm -hmm. Uh, does the collage work fit with that? Is it to the side? Um, and but you know more more generally, how did how has teaching and teaching future architects shaped shaped what you're doing or uh, made you more major? I don't know about me, but when when I teach, I always think about all the stuff I didn't I didn't know that I I um, kind of know now, and then imagine all the things I still don't know that I will never learn. Um, that's, the, yeah. that's, that's less productive, but, um, it means, could you say more about your teaching practice and, um, how that's, how that shaped what you're doing and how maybe you think, think differently than you did right out of architecture school, for instance. So I've been teaching now for about 15 years in various schools, um, around the U S and, um, What's rewarding about it is that uh, within the academy, 
the my job description is very short. Um, I get paid to think, right? And for someone who is, cares mostly about ideas, what could be better? Um, in terms of pedagogy, in terms of teaching, um, specifically related to collage, um, I teach it. It's a tricky thing especially to teach, especially when in the context of architecture schools, because what's very strange, and I didn't get into this into the t in the talk, is that collage has been, has played an incredibly important role, especially throughout the 20th and 21st century in architecture. And it has in many creative fields, but unlike in other creative fields where it's been wholly embraced and is now a kind of, you know, it's almost kind of matter of fact, right? Um, in architecture, it still remains an incredibly kind of, um, I would almost say marginal practice. So even though Mies van der Rohe's collages are sitting like front and center when you go to MoMA, <laughs> right? It's still a, a, a marginal, considered a marginal practice in the, in, the, in the pedagogy of architecture and in the practice of architecture. So unlike drawing of plans, um, and other kinds of draw or perspectives, or unlike um, the making of models, there are no conventions of collage. I have my own conventions, some of which I started to describe this evening, but there are no, like you can't find, a, it's, it's, not, it's not a requirement, <laughs> certainly not a requirement. And we certainly don't have any conventions for collage in architecture. Maybe someday they will. And in fact, it's a bit of a dream of mine to, to maybe create them. Right, or maybe someone will create them after the fact. So that's a kind of interesting and problematic relationship. So when when I bring it into my teaching, it's always it, it's always by definition on a very limited basis. So it winds up showing up in some seminars and an exercise. Um, but the problem with collages is that it's much harder than everyone thinks. It looks easy, <laughs> but it's extremely difficult to do to do it well. And it takes a lot of practice for a lot of years. Whereas you can, I could teach you how to make a good plan drawing today, right? Um, you know, or to, or how to construct a, uh, a perspective, right? There are rules, but collage, it's, um, it requires insight and it requires that you can look at one thing over here, another thing over here, another thing over there, and like put them together in your mind, or you have to come to it with a certain insight, right? And so I think if I have a superpower, that's probably it, which is I'm constantly taking things apart and putting them back together, taking them apart and putting them back together in new ways, um, whether it's collage or in some other medium or like with this little model right here. I mean, this thing actually, it's, it's all puzzled together just like the collages. So it can be taken apart and, and put back together. And um, so that's a, that's a, yeah, so in the context of teaching architecture, it's, it's an interesting challenge, but maybe that's okay, right? <laughs> that's okay. Maybe it shouldn't be um, a convention. Maybe that's kind of anathema to the whole idea of collage. I don't know, and it's kind of transgressive, but I see if it's trans, as it's transgressive role, maybe it shouldn't be taught so much. I don't, I don't know. It's something I, I've thought about quite a bit. Well, I'm reminded, you know, Janet Malcolm, who I'm quite a writer I'm quite fond of, she has had, in addition to being a writer, a collage practice for many decades that she's now started showing, although that's kind of recent. Um, and uh, certainly a lot of writing is, at least for me, splicing my sentences and moving them. Of course. Away. The cut up method, yeah, yes. exactly, um, and quite a lot for me. But I was, there, I, I, I couldn't help but notice. I guess I'm, I, you know, I read read too much psychoanalytic stuff at a certain stage in my life. But as you're describing the medium of collage, you say things like it's a medium of risk; it can't be undone. Um, there's many, many choices, and there are unintended consequences, and there can be. And I, I, I couldn't help but think that sounds like architecture, right? Um, once it's built, uh, there's um, and certain, it seemed like a mirror, um, 
you know, I don't, I don't know how much to make of that, but it, it seems like I'm, it, it could be a kind of mirror for certain kinds of criticisms of, archi of grandiose architectural practice that from the 19, criticisms that were aired in the kind of 60s, 70s and 80s. I don't know, I think that's just, um, I get that they're distinct, but it was kind of a, a funny, uh, funny moment of uh, congruence. Um, and, had one more, what was my other question? I had a, um, oh, um, what are you working on now? What are you thinking about these days? I mean, it's such a strange, it's a very weird moment. It's hard to know where to, for me, it's yeah. very hard to know where to put my time, but like what's, uh, what is occupying your headspace at the moment other than the virus? And so many things. <laughs> So I have two book projects I'm working on, two book projects, um, one of which is about collage, specifically about my collage practice, and one which is about the architecture and urbanism work. And hopefully, at least one of them should be, be, should be out by next fall. Um, and then I'm also working on a new collage series that kind of takes on a new scale. Um, they're a similar scale to this uh, Vanderbilt Tower collage, which you see off here to my left. Um, but for the first time, these very large collages will not have a site, will not have, so it's a kind of next step from the last series that I, sh that I showed. Um, and so just the, you know, the kind of scaling up has kind of forced some new issues in terms of the technique, the quality of the images and the way that I think about them and the way that you know, they engage people. So I'm working on that right now. Um, I'm working on some designed objects for the home and um, including some lights, some lighting objects, kind of light sculptures, thinking a lot about Noguchi's uh, uh, lamps, Isama Noguchi's lamps. Um, I'm also working with a collaborator on a potential, on a, on a design for a rug. Um, as a kind of meditation on the American landscape. So, you know, just a few things, just a few things, just like a little of this, a little of that, you know. Keep, us, uh, keep, keep me informed about all of these. And um, I, think, I think we're gonna, we've, we've had a great conversation. And if there's anything else you wanna say, you should go for it. But otherwise we're gonna, we're, I'm gonna let you go, release you to the world to uh, keep being uh, creative and working on all these projects. But please let us know uh, what you're working on and keep us informed here in Santa Barbara. But, I will. Thank you for the invitation, James, and thanks uh, to the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. We're, we're very pleased to have you. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, My take pleasure. care, stay safe, bye. All right, good afternoon.